We have with us tonight one of the most distinguished atmospheric physicists in the world. Please welcome Dr. Richard Linzer. Thank you. What I'd like to do in this talk, and I hope I don't go on too long, is to remind people of a few simple truths that our side often forgets. And the first of these is that being skeptical about global warming does not by itself make one a good scientist nor does endorsing global warming make one, per se, a poor scientist. And one of the most difficult things, I think, for someone who is actively involved in the scientific community is to realize, in my case, for instance, that most of the atmospheric scientists who I respect do endorse global warming. The important point, however, is that the science that they do, that I respect, is not about global warming. Endorsing global warming just makes their lives easier. The second point is that most arguments about global warming boil down to science versus authority. For much of the public, authority will generally win since they do not wish to deal with science. My third point is related to the second point, and that is that the success of environmentalism with respect to authority also gives the alarm movement control over carrots and sticks, which in turn is what makes it so convenient for scientists to go along. The process of co-opting science on behalf of a political movement has had an extraordinarily corrupting influence on science, especially since the issue has been a major motivation for funding. Most funding for climate would not be there without this issue. In any event, one of the things about impacts is that they generally are dependent on regional forecasts. Such forecasts are no better than guesses. Now, that might seem like a problem to you from a scientific perspective, but from a propagandistic or impact perspective, that's wonderful. Because guesses have the advantage of allowing anything to be projected and they are so used. What can be done? Well, here I'll turn to a variety of proposals, both naive and perhaps less naive. The most obvious point, I think, is to persevere. We shouldn't give up. We should try to better understand the science, and in particular, to emphasize logic, which ultimately has to trump alleged authority. Actually, the science isn't all that hard. John Sununu, who will be speaking at this meeting, offered an easily appreciated example of positive and negative feedback. And I like this one. He suggested in your car, the gas and brake pedals act as negative feedbacks to reduce speed when you're going too fast and to increase it when you're going too slow. The example of a positive feedback would be if someone were to reverse the position of the pedals without informing you. So that now you would be increasing your speed when you're going too fast and slowing down when you're going too slow. Now on the face of it, this does not seem like a reasonable way to build a system. And yet, alarming predictions depend critically on the fact that models have large positive feedbacks. The crucial question is whether nature actually behaves that way. The answer, I would suggest, is unambiguously no. 
Now let's see how one can test this. And, and that, this is amazing because we're arguing about temperatures and we're arguing about all this, but the issue has always been referred to as the greenhouse effect. Can one test that by itself? In the common, though somewhat inaccurate, picture of the greenhouse effect, greenhouse substances, they're mainly thin high clouds and water vapor, but they also include carbon dioxide, methane, freons, and other things, acts as a blanket. It inhibits the emission of infrared or heat radiation. We know that in the absence of feedbacks, in which water, these feedbacks say that water vapor and clouds act to amplify the effect of added CO2, in these things, if we increase temperature, that will lead to a certain increase in this heat radiation. With positive feedbacks, this amount of radiation will be reduced. Now, the idea here is just in terms of the blanket imagery, the blanket has gotten thicker. Current models indeed behave this way. If you force a current model with observed sea surface temperature, it emits very little thermal radiation as the temperature goes up. Getting people, including many scientists, to understand this is crucial. Once it is understood, the silliness of the whole issue becomes evident. Unfortunately, though, those who are committed to warming alarm as either a vehicle for a postmodern coup d'etat or for illicit profits will obviously try to obfuscate matters. I would suggest that one useful tactic would be to have a major campaign to get thousands of scientists to resign from professional societies that have taken unrepresentative stands on the warming issue while making the reason for the resignation unambiguous and public. This would, in my opinion, be far more effective than simply collecting thousands of signatures for petitions. The global warming issue has done much to set back climate science. In particular, the notion that climate is one-dimensional, which is to say that it is totally described by some fictitious global mean temperature and some single gross forcing, a la increased CO2, is grotesque in its oversimplification. Finally, I would suggest that however grim things may appear, I think we'll eventually win against anthropogenic global warming alarm simply because we are right and they are wrong. But at least this audience should be aware that this does nothing to mitigate the failure of nature to properly follow the models. The fact that you have record-breaking years does not tell you that the trend was not there. And when I hear that argument commonly presented, you should be prepared to reject it. To claim otherwise betrays either gross ignorance or grosser dishonesty. Unfortunately, when it comes to global warming hysteria, neither has been in short supply. Thank you.